have Ian Davey with me, and uh, he's living right next to Lake Biwa, and he built this beautiful echo house, he drives an echo car, he lives an echo life. So we're gonna talk about lots of echo stuff. Please join us, we will be right back. Mm, thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. Now you've you've moved in there. How many years ago now? Uh, this was we we bought the land in 2011. We completed the house build in 2013. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. you've been living in it once it's finished about seven years, but is everything finished or it's an ongoing process? Uh, it's always ongoing, especially the garden project. You know. Uh, like planting trees and then you, uh, you you plant trees where you think they'll be good and then they get bigger, of course, and they get overcrowded. So we're still in the process of having to move stuff around a little bit whenever right. possible. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's step back a little bit. Uh, originally, you're from the UK. Where about? Well, I was born on a small island, Guernsey, which is a Channel Island near France. So, uh, But my, my parents now live in Devon, which is uh, southwest of England. Yeah, uh, and, yeah. And you said you, uh, when you were 13, you worked on a farm, you got interested in growing your own food, is that right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Uh, the, that area is all kind of small scale mixed farming, so sheep, cows, yeah. And uh, yeah, I got interested in farming and I worked on a farm every weekend, holidays. Yeah. Nice. Right. So you learned some skills. And then when did you come to Japan originally? Uh, I came to Japan in 1994, so just before the earthquake, Kobe earthquake, actually. Straight? Yeah. Did you move straight to Kyoto, where you are now, or like That's the right. Shiga yeah, area? Well, living in Kyoto, and yeah, we we decided to kind of we're always looking to move to the countryside, a bit more space. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, nice. And you're teaching at Kyoto University, is that right? Uh, Kyoto University of Foreign Studies. Kyoto, Kyoto Gaidai, yeah. And I saw that you're doing some sustainability-focused projects with your students. Can you right. yeah. introduce that a little bit? Something about uh, well, notebooks or? Yeah, we did that. Um, we, I set up um, an echo group, uh, which isn't self-sustaining, ironically, at the moment, because the, the best students are usually the third or fourth years, and they just get going, and then they leave. And then we've got to kind of start the whole process moving again. But we've had some successful projects. We've been running Earth Day for the last two years. Uh, this year, of course, there wasn't uh, any uh, event. But that, that was really popular, and uh, that really engaged a lot of students uh, more than maybe the other projects we do. But yeah, yeah, we made notebooks out of recycled, used, reused paper, and we were selling those for charity. So yeah, that's awesome. A few things. I I think education is often the missing link in Japan. That there's just not enough going on in terms of raising awareness about in the environmental issues on the ed education level. I love that on the in the elementary school that all the kids are encouraged to grow their own plants. Right yeah. and and bring it home during the summer holidays. Yeah. I love that. Um, yeah. But other than that, you know, I would love to see groups of kids out collecting plastic waste next to the rivers in the ocean. I mean, this this conversation about what we buy and what we waste is so important. And so I'm so glad to hear that you're doing that with university students, trying to raise awareness. Yeah, well, almost every topic I, I, I teach uh, environmental issues, and in the second semester we we I teach uh, sustainable development. But almost every after every topic, it always comes back to awareness is the key, because without awareness, there's no caring, and you know the, the people don't have a chance to do anything if they they don't know that a problem exists. Yeah. And I feel uh, education, not only education, I think the media in Japan kind of surrounds everything in cotton wool and people don't really have a chance to actually be exposed to the real issues in, in my 
in my opinion anyway. Yeah, definitely. And I, I do monthly um, cleanups, trying to get people to come out and just pick up a little bit. Of course, there's so little you can do, but it raises awareness. And then sometimes students will join and they'll say, wow, this makes me think about what I'm going to buy. I'm not going to buy that plastic bottle again, you know, because I just picked up five. <laughs> so, so it does help to have activities where they're engaging with the problem. And then yes. it, it educates their consumerism, right? Sure, absolutely. I, I think there's unfortunately a, a, a too much of a focus on the recycling aspect, which makes people feel okay about their consumption. And I don't think that really changes the situation. Uh, people still consume, but they feel a little bit happier about it. Maybe that's not the right way <laughs> to yeah. go. Yeah. yeah, yeah, doing beach cleanups and actually yeah, seeing the results. Yeah. Uh, are more important, I think. Yeah, I, I often get that, right? Like if we do a big beach cleanup, you have over a hundred pet bottles that you get, pet drink bottles that you get from the ocean. And yes. then I always post that on Twitter and people always say, oh, I always think of pet bottles as being like a hundred percent recyclable, but it's mm -hmm. it's really not, you know, and it often ends up in the waterways. So it's it's always good, especially for young people to be using social media and to be sharing the reality and I think that helps a lot, yeah. right? That's right, yeah. Well, that's one thing my uh, group of students are, are doing much better than me. They're sharing stuff on their Instagram account because, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're so good. They're so web they savvy, right? They are, yeah. They put in all these <laughs> anime, you know, stuff that I, I don't know where they came from. And, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm we yeah. need to defer to them. They're the social media experts, that's for sure. Well, yeah. Yes, yeah. but I, I tell you, when when the uh, f every year a few students get engaged and they get caught up in the the real seriousness of the issues, they they really go for it and they they make a huge change. That's just, awesome. Just a few, but it's just a few students. It's not it's not a there's no tipping point yet. Yeah. yeah, but then those few students can affect so many others. So they hopefully. Do, yeah. Hopefully there's a good effect there. Um, yeah. Thank you for sharing the video of you and your wife and family were interviewed on TV. So we're going to show some some uh, shots from that. That was okay. really, that must have been, how was that experience? <laughs> it was very interesting because my Japanese is terrible. So I was very reliant on my wife. But, uh, and, you know, she did a great, she's, she's a natural performer, which is, I'm from England. I'm kind of the opposite, <laughs> a bit reluctant. But um, the big eye-opener was we were trying to talk about the insulation of the house and the, the fire, the, why we had a, a wood stove that's carbon neutral and trying to get away from fossil fuel. We were not allowed, we were, we were told black and white, we were not allowed to talk about those issues. Why? And the reason why was because the program was sponsored by Kansai Electric. Oh, interesting. <laughs> So, yeah, that is a true story. Oh, so, yeah. wow. Yeah, yeah. In, the, in the show, I learned that you guys met while you were teaching. So she's also at Kyoto University? Yeah, she, I uh, know, she, she works at the, um, she works at another university in the, off, she's office staff in off, uh, Ritzmaken University. Yeah. Yeah. But so. also in Kyoto, yeah? Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. We, yeah. And so. she's, she's from Korea, is that right? That's right, yeah. She was born in Japan, but she, yeah, from Korea originally. Yeah. So you guys have a very multilingual, multicultural household. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. How, do you, how do you do that? What's the normal language? Is it all mixed or? Well, pretty much they're, they're absolutely bilingual. So, you know, they switch languages depending on the subject. So if they're talking about school, it's going to be in Japanese and, and with, with my wife. But generally, 90% is just uh, defaults to English. So, yeah. Yeah, that's great. I was talking with a bilingual, multilingual expert last week, and he's, he's saying, you know, that's so exciting for kids when they're around so many languages, and they just pick it up so naturally. You don't have to worry about exposing them to too much. The more, the yes. better. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Well, our mother-in-law is trying to teach them uh, Korean now. Oh, nice. <laughs> wow, wonderful. Uh it's great to get more yeah. more people from the family involved. I love that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, let's dive in because you've got so much great stuff to talk about with your house. Um, okay. How first? How did you choose your house? Give us a little bit of background. How did you find it? 
well the location speaks for itself it's on on the lake and it's in the countryside yet it's it's 40 minutes from kyoto so it kind of ticked all the boxes we could still work in kyoto but live a, a more rural life with you know farm animals um yeah so that was the initial thing it was the location so after that um it had a pension an old dilapidated pension on the site so that offered us a chance to do a, a complete fresh uh rebuild or half build as they call it and uh then i set out designing a house from you know all, all the programs i've watched and stuff like that so yeah, yeah. so describe the house uh, inside and out outside you have solar on the roof and yep. you you also have a green roof yes right uh, if you like it, would you like me to show you the green room? Yeah, please. I mean, it's looking a bit poor because the weather, of course. Um, well, this is just, this is a very small one. And tell us the, the benefits. If you can see. Yeah, I can see it. The benefits of a green roof, of course, is to grow things, but also insulation, right? Yeah, the, the shed where the, the main green roof is, is incredibly cool. It really is. It, it makes a huge difference. Um, but also, of course, it, w when it rains hard, you can see regular guttering. Instantly, there's water coming down. But uh, when the, for the green roof, it takes maybe 20 minutes for the water to seep through down through the guttering. So it really shows the benefits of having natural kind of green dams, you know, up in the forests, uh, using the forests as dams and stuff like that for f uh, flood prevention. And of course, it supports biodiversity and looks good, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Can yeah. you can you take us through the process? I'm showing photos right now of the okay. stages. So can you take us through the stages? Well, the first thing is you have to make sure it's weight the weight bearing you know is suitable because when soil gets wet, of course, it's it's very heavy. So that's the first thing. Uh, then you have various layers. First, waterproofing. Then uh, I don't remember the order to be honest. But then there's a there's a layer of um, well, we use carpet, just just floor carpet, which actually helps to hold the moisture in times when it's dry. Then you have large pumice, pumice stones to help drainage. And on top of that, a weed barrier to stop the roots penetrating too deeply or too strongly. And finally, you have a kind of a, a loamy, sandy soil. Um, and most importantly, you have to choose the, the right vegetation. So I used a sedum, I, I, uh, from England, I got a sedum green roof mix. So sedums are a bit like a cacti, cactus. They're, you know, kind of rubbery leaves. So they're very, very good at uh, dealing with droughts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you don't need to worry about watering too much, you mean? Don't. Uh, after a year, once the roots have matted, yeah, the, there's no watering actually, and that, and that helps with weeding because the weeds don't survive. So, yeah, how long did it take you to put the green roof together? Oh, no, it's not long. It's really, oh, yeah, I've done quite a few now. So, it's uh, yeah, it's just a, a day, a couple of days. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. And then once it's ready, once it's there, um, how much maintenance do you need to water it once a day? Especially now it's so hot or. No, I haven't watered a single time this year. But when you first do it and the seeds are still growing, you, you do need to water like a regular garden. But the idea is that, you know, if it's on top of a, a house, then uh, some professional ones, they do have watering systems, but uh, they shouldn't need watering. Uh, the, the purpose is that are self-maintaining. Wow, so, yeah. wonderful. It's something yeah. I've thought about for ages. I have... Um, a shed like you which I was thinking would be great to cover um, yep. with a green roof and like you we have solar on our roof roof um, but the shed might be something that I can do myself um, put it yeah. put it on so sure. I might try your your concept and it's gonna drive my husband crazy um, but you know it's so hot and anything that can help insulate because that that shed is right next to our house, so it would help insulate inside as well. 
Is it a, what's the pitch of the roof? Is it, is it like? It's very similar to, it's not a very steep grade. Um, oh, that's and it's not a huge area. Um, my husband's really worried about insects, that it'll increase the insects. Did you find that? A lot of insects? That's a good, that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll have to uh, pick your brain a bit more detail when I, I start the process. But it, it looks like you used a carpet, but also you had to, of course, line it with plastic first. Yes, we got um, that was the main expense is the pond liner. It's a kind of a, a high grade pond liner, okay. which we got from England again. Yeah, I should mention when maybe I should mention when we did the house, we the biggest part was sourcing things because many things aren't available in this country. So we we kind of hired a shipping container and everything literally came over in one load. And that that included pond liner. <laughs> I, I have a I, I had an idea, but it might be too labor intensive um, to take all the plastic bags that we pick up in the cleanups and line it with that. But it would be problematic because it wouldn't seal. Right. That's, right. That's yeah. the key. Yeah, it's got to be waterproof. Yeah. <clears throat> Very <laughs> important. Sorry. Sorry. Too bad. It was a nice idea. It's so yeah. it's so hard to think of how the heck we could use any of the plastic waste. You know, how could we reuse it without adding microplastics back to the waterways? Like, yeah, yeah it's a problem. The best solution, I, the most exciting solution I've seen so far is, uh, the te is a TED talk about a plastic bank. So you pay with plastic. So this is particularly in develop, 80, I think about 80% of sea ocean plastic comes from developing countries. So the project works in those kind of countries and... They set up a systems like schools where pupils will collect plastic and then they pay for their tuition with plastic. The plastic is then sold on and used for creating products or, you know, burning, I guess. Wow. And I saw a project in India where they had they were collecting so many plastic bags. They were making plastic bricks that they found found a way to push it down into bricks and then building houses with that so it's it's insulated as well yeah. but yeah that's that's major you need a special well, machine maybe yeah well that was a big decision these are the kind of decisions i had to make about that with the house uh should i have wooden frames or should we have the plastic pvc um and i decided on plastic because as far as i could see it it's either going to be burned in cars or it's going to be locked in in plastic frames, which ultimately could be recycled later on. And the life, you know, the life of the windows is much, much longer. So that was one kind of decisions I had to make uh, regarding the house. Yeah. <laughs> Trade-offs. Yeah. Trade-offs, right? You have to make the best decision with what is available is, yes. is all about sustainability, right? Yeah. So um, some of the other build, tell us about the build. What was the, in the video you said the hardest part was the roof, making the roof. Uh, why was that? Well, uh, the roof, the roof. Why did I say that? Uh, just because you had to rebuild the roof part or insulation? Oh, not, not the roof. That's right, the ceiling. Okay. The ceiling. Yeah, because uh, we're having to put up the, the plasterboard and, and try and put in the screws at the same time it's just terrible on the shoulders so yeah that and, and this is in the summer so it was yeah that was definitely the hardest part just it the, looks the... it looks beautiful your view from the house you can see the mountains and the lake is that right it, it looks amazing yeah i think yeah i always think of it as a like how i the stereotype of california you got the mountains on in one way and you got the ocean the other well, although this is not the ocean but yeah, it's, it's a nice feeling. Beautiful. And I see that all the wood that you sourced um, is FSC certified? As much as we could, yep. Uh, we couldn't, of course, we weren't going to bring all the timber from England, where, which would, could easily be sourced FSC. But um, most of it was FSC sourced. The floor downstairs was uh, from New Zealand, and that was on a 23 year or so cycle sustainable cycle but it wasn't fsc but uh it was a similar management system yeah, yeah. 
Um, when we've done re remodel work, it's actually really hard to find builders that are willing to use um, Japan wood or FSC. A lot of the builders I talked to were like, what? <laughs> Yeah, what is that? that? Just... No, we import from rainforests in Indonesia and New Zealand. I was like, no, please don't yeah. do that. Yeah, it's cheaper. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's that's the thing. Uh, we had a very we had a good builder and a good architect who we know, so we could work with them, and they're relatively flexible in, in letting us do what we wanted. Just things like even putting a bathroom upstairs is oh that can't be done. Oh well, it can. <laughs> and not having a unit bath, but just building our own bathroom using a simple, you know, things like that. So, yeah, you, you do have to kind of, you are going against the flow in terms of working with builders. Yeah. So, yeah, that's right. Um, I saw that it was a existing building when you bought it and you've reused the wood uh, that's right. in the fireplace. Is that right? Uh, as much all, all the decking and unfortunately that was one that was one of the examples using the builder they weren't able to use the beams because there's a lot of trouble taking out individual nails and it, it's it blunts the sores and a lot of problems so we kept all the wood and that's being used around the house decking and stuff like that yeah so, yeah, we packaged up the whole building, basically. <laughs> yeah, and you've reused it. So, you know, is that in the fireplace you've reused it? Well, we used, most, like I say, mostly decking. Mm -hmm. And it's been used in the fireplace in terms of we've burned some, mm -hmm. yeah, because that couldn't be used in buildings. Anything could be used in building was uh, is being used for the fire. Yes, that's right. And it, uh, you're also, it seems like your main points of the reason this is called an echo house. Um, can you just give us the run through? What are the key features? Well, I think uh, the first one is the, it's, it's impact and the building process where, where you're sourcing everything from. So we wanted to minimize concrete, for example. I tried to get carbon neutral concrete or carbon reduced footprint co concrete that was really that was impossible so things that's the first stage trying to minimize the impact during the build the second stage of course is uh you know insulation and energy source so to minimize running how much energy we're using uh for the running uh, i think we produce about twice as much energy as we use so it's it's, it's a very efficient house <laughs> yeah that's great so I tried to base it on the principles of passive house, but without the technologies. You know, passive house is very reliant on high technologies like uh, heat exchangers, ventilation systems. So we did without that, uh, but otherwise in terms of windows, insulation and natural airflow, that was kind of all based on passive house techniques, uh, design. Yeah. Yeah. And did you find, um, like, did you apply for the fit system for the solar? Like, did you get paid back for solar that you sold to the grid? Yes, yes, yes. That's yeah. That was in 2013. So we're locked in for 10 years at 41, 41 or 2 yen a, 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 a kilowatt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kilowatt, sorry. Um, unfortunately, that's now down to like 11 or so, so the, the government isn't quite so gun-ho about <laughs> supporting yeah. solar. Yeah. It's a shame, isn't it? Uh, when we first got our system uh, 12 years ago, uh, we, we applied and we got it at a great rate. And yeah. so we paid off our solar system in eight years if you compare what we were paying for electricity before and after as well as the payback from the solar we sold so it's a great yes. it was a great system i hope they bring it back yeah well i i was watching one of your earlier sessions and the guy uh, sorry i don't remember his name he mentioned about the you know the the life cycle of japanese houses i mean if there was a simple law that solar should be fitted to every new house yes. like I think he said that then yeah we we would <laughs> Yeah, definitely. We we need to in improv, incentivize people to to make the investment, and then once they make the investment, they realize how beneficial it is financially and 
you know, environmentally. So yeah. definitely. Well, again, it's, it's back down to the awareness. People really don't, if they are aware that, okay, I don't have the money for this, it's a big expense. But I, if I borrow money to get it, I'm still going to make money and I'm not using any fossil fuels. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so some of the other features at your house, you're doing water catchment systems? Well, around for the garden, everything is, uh, yeah, we collect all the water, but in, in really serious times like now, we I have to use hose occasionally. Um, and the pond is hooked up, The half the pond is like a, a wet water, a wetland area, and we dive, I have a system where I can divert the water into the pond, so it kind of filters through the plants. Not terribly successful, after about three or four weeks it does start to smell and I have to disconnect and let it catch up, let the plants catch up. So I basically need a larger area, I think, for it to work more efficiently, but yeah. And how are the seasons? Is it is it pretty hot right now? Oh yeah, 30, <laughs> yeah, 34, yeah, we, yeah. Of course it's cooler, we're next to the lake. Uh, we do get breezes, which make a huge, which this house really relies on breezes. So, um, yeah, uh, we always have the windows are open and, uh, yeah, natural ventilation. But the seasons are, of course, less snow than... Than before, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Down. And the local ski joe was uh, very, very, had very little snow this year, almost no, no snow. So. Yeah, it looked like um, you used to get a fair bit of snow. I'm showing your season's house photo right now. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, this year was particularly was the worst, I, I think, so far. And typhoons, we've uh, speaking to locals, the number of typhoons we've had over the last three or four years is really, and the severity, the whole beach was destroyed. Take like meters and meters of sand just disappeared, and that that hasn't happened in living memory, uh, according to the locals. So, yeah, quite a few changes. And around the pond, it looks like you're using old roof tiles. Uh, yep, yeah, roof tiles, and the land is landscaped with uh, car tires. So, <clears throat> yeah, I saw that the tire garden. <laughs> yeah, which is now uh, you can't see it. It's it's disappeared. The tires have disappeared. So oh, because the plants have gone overgrown. It nice. Yep, take over completely. So yeah. that's other feature of being sustainable. Sustainable living, of course, is growing your own food. It looks like yes. um, in the gardens you have some covered areas, maybe for salads. Well, for the mostly for the cold cold times, we have some windows, uh, which yeah, so just to cover a few of the beds, but most of it's out pretty much, yeah. But that's just for seedlings and yeah, maybe springtime, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So we do we try and grow as I like perennial <laughs> perennials because it's less work, of course. So um, I'm trying to encourage as many perennials, you know, fruit trees and vines and stuff to grow. So kind of trying to use principles of permaculture a little bit. Um, Agroforestry in the back garden is pretty much just trees, mature trees. And the uh, vegetable garden area is mostly the front area. Yeah. It looks like you have olives. Oh, yes, we have olives, yes, which uh, they're very fickle. Uh, every two years, I think, they produce. Because <laughs> I have a few olive trees and I've never had fruit. Um, I'm hoping someday. <laughs> yeah, it takes time. It takes quite some time, yeah. We rescued those olive trees, actually, from um, a, a, a car park in Kyoto. They were... <laughs> They were basically dead, and I just took them home because they are very expensive olive trees, and they were quite big. But uh, yeah, they survived, and they're doing okay now. So. Wow, awesome! Yeah, um, I'm showing a picture of your olives on a plate, your tomatoes. You're making your own bread. You have um, goats, so you have yogurt and milk, right? Right. Yes, that's right. Yeah. How is the, it? Uh, yeah, talk talk about the animals. 
Well, that was the main. That was one of the main reasons we moved here. Space. I wasn't. When I think of space, it was animals. Uh, you know, because I think you know, protein has the highest carbon footprint. So I felt if we could be almost self-sufficient in our protein, that would take a big chunk out of you know our carbon footprint. So more than maybe vegetables and. So yeah, we have a go. We have goats, four goats at the moment. Uh, one is milking a dairy goat. She she produces about three liters of milk every day, which is a commitment. You have to milk every day. You have to consume the milk or cheese, yogurt, or freeze it. You know, and uh, we have chickens. So yeah, do you ever sell any of the the milk or cheese or yogurt or or is it just uh, you guys, I'm not sure if I'm allowed. I'm not sure if it's strictly <laughs> legal. Well, if you if you pay yeah, tax on it, yeah. 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 Uh, oh yeah, but yeah, I wasn't thinking about that. <laughs> I'm assuming you're paying tax on it. Um, yeah. So the chickens supply eggs, and uh, you also eat the chickens sometimes. I hear chickens. Yes. Chickens are excellent pets. I've heard they eat almost anything from kitchen waste. They do, yeah, they do. They're very good. Uh, they will not eat, I don't know why, I haven't looked in, but potatoes are off the menu and citrus, anything citrus. But otherwise, they'll, they'll eat almost anything, yeah. Yeah, I had a friend who had chickens, and when I visited her, we had had a big plate of spaghetti, and there was spaghetti left over. She just threw it out to the chickens, and they loved it. I thought, I never think of chickens as liking spaghetti, but yeah, great. Yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> But I heard back in the UK, the they're not allowed, or some there's regulations. You're not allowed to feed food waste to oh. animals, which is I, not a good idea. I think as long it's, as it's vegetarian, as long as it's not other animals, right? No. Well, yeah, we don't we don't need. Uh, occasionally, meat does come into the household, but generally, we they don't. But they will eat anything. Mm. And they will prefer fish and meat, to be honest. Than, really, that's yeah, interesting. Yeah. 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 I and both. I hear I mean the image of a chicken is is quite nasty like they'll peck at you but I heard chickens are actually quite sweet when they're your pets. Yeah, they're constantly just whatever they do clucking I guess is the word. But the the sound is very quite relaxing cuz we got them just outside our kitchen. But uh cockerels are uh, sorry, roosters are very yes, generally very aggressive. So they don't last long so you don't sleep in then because you have kitchen uh chickens who are waking you up every morning right at the moment we have no we, we don't have any mature cockles that's what i mean they, they don't really last very long oh they're the ones that get eaten you mean pretty much yeah <laughs> well i mean your your kids are growing up very honest about where meat comes from and i think that's part of the problem with processed meat factory farming meat is that it's it's too clean but also it's too removed from where the meat actually comes from right oh yes absolutely i strongly feel if you are um, if if you if people are to consume meat they should really be prepared to know where it comes from and maybe even be involved yeah how do you, how do your kids feel when you choose a, a chicken to to a, it must be a, hard no, no, no. They're, yeah. they're hacking. They're quite, maybe worryingly quite hard, hard-hearted. <laughs> Seriously. Wow. So we don't, uh, we don't name the chickens, although one chicken does currently have a name, but um, generally they don't get named. That's, that's the, to, the idea. To help with that, that part of the process. Yes. Um, let's, and, uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, no, no. Uh, two, go ahead. Two daughters avoid. Uh, we got one eight-year-old, but the two older one, uh, twelve and fourteen, they both watched me kill. So they're by re by request. They requested. So, yeah, quite an education. Yeah, well, it's good. You know, they really understand it. I think yeah. that's that's healthier to help process, right? What yes. they're eating. Yeah. Um, let's, yeah, yes. go ahead. Yeah, okay. no, no, it's okay. Okay. Uh, let's talk about insulation. Was that also imported? Yes, it was. We used um, a product. It's called Super Quilt. It's quite easy to remember, but it's extremely uh, efficient. And the best thing about it is very thin. It's very, 
So it's equivalent of about 28 centimeters of rock wool, I think you call it, or regular insulation. But it's only a, a centimeter thick, I think, but extremely efficient. And also it keeps out the sun, so it's reflective, which uh, regular you know, insulation doesn't do. So in the summer, it helps a lot. So, yeah. So and, I did a, and you had, yeah, go sorry. ahead. I did quite a bit of research, each kind of component of the house. I would research for two or three weeks, then I would choose then kind of have to move on to the next product or, you know, aspect of the house. But we, um, insulation was quite difficult to, to choose. Yeah. Yeah. And including all of the remodel of the kitchen, all the new appliances and everything and the solar um, what do you think the total spend was? How much did you have to spend to remodel? Did you ever well, calculate? Well, we had a budget, yeah. Um, I mean, to be honest, if we just got a house, a kit house, you know, a regular build house, this house is much, much, much cheaper. It's probably about, yeah, it's much about, yeah, much, much cheaper. <laughs> so we did, it could have been even cheaper, of course, if it didn't have the high-end insulation and triple glazing windows and stuff. But, yeah, that is a – yeah, of course, it was a consideration. But it wasn't – we tried not to cut back on those, that aspect of the house, uh, the, the echo aspects. And was it a uh, Akia? Was it an abandoned house? Yes, where the site is, yes, that's right. It was a um, pension, yeah, mm -hmm. old pension. So. And it, it looks like in the, in the pictures, I don't have any now, but it looks like the, the side of the house was facing the, the lake, that they didn't have the view I know. <laughs> in the original build. I couldn't believe that. So what you've done is really focus the view from the kitchen goes right out to the lake, the view from the front living room goes right out to the lake. You've really incorporated the natural views as part of the appeal of the house, right? Absolutely, yes. I mean, to be honest, the the location, if the lake was 90 degrees, then I think actually the house would be in a different direction because the first, the first uh, priority really was the solar, the angle of the sun. And luckily, the shore of the lake is south 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 east so it's almost perfect so that that was the starting point of the design was the angle of the roof the large roof mm -hmm. area and the angle and the house was to face the front of the house was to face south as much as possible wonderful yeah That's and it good. also helps with the breeze because the mountain lake breeze goes right through the house basically that's fantastic so. i grew up in hawaii in kind of the mountains area and we never yeah. had air conditioning we always just had screens and the breezes coming through and so yeah. if you can find a place where you can do that that's fantastic yeah uh maybe about two or three t two or three days of the year i get complaints from the family but basically we're we survive yeah no problem. That's wonderful. Because a lot of the time in the UK, you don't even have screens on the windows because no. people would never have the windows open. But recently, it's been so hot. So maybe house design is changing, huh? I hope so, yeah. And we stopped using the screens, actually. We realized the mosquitoes aren't to, don't come in for some reason. Uh, but yeah, anyway. That's great. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the inside of the house because you, you have certain features which might be different from a typical Japanese house, like your pantry. I love your oh. pantry. <laughs> yes. It's fantastic. Yeah, I, was, I was determined to have a pantry. So the only mistake, that was a, one of the biggest mistakes of the house. The uh, solar system inverter is located in the pantry and that, of course, produces heat. Oh. So that is... The big mistake, yeah. So, but otherwise, the pantry is insulated uh, and it has a window, a, a back-facing, north-facing window. So the principles of, yeah, the general principles of a cool room uh, pretty much uh, work out okay, yeah. So you can buy a lot in bulk and use it as a storage place for all your family needs. I love, uh, I love that yeah. idea. 
I mean, my image would be my my perfect image would be you know all my lentils and and hanging cheeses and yogurts, but no, nah, it's not not the reality. To be honest, it's, it's full of Costco. <laughs> Well, uh, at least you're buying in bulk, which is yeah. less less packaging. Um, yes. Your your kitchen is beautiful. The design of the kitchen with the island. You've got a chalkboard on the side. Describe your kitchen for us. Well, yes. The well, that was mostly my wife's uh, domain. You know, she wanted to do that. But uh, yeah, and the chalkboard was her idea for the kids. The, having one wall, you just paint it with a special paint, which is uh, yeah, like a blackboard. Um, and that was another mistake with the design of the house. We actually had a small window at the back of the kitchen. It's quite narrow. We've actually now changed that. We have a much larger window and the air just rushes through now. So that was one, maybe another mistake in our design. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, the kitchen was from Ikea. Yeah. And about a hundred boxes. <laughs> so it was a bit of, a bit of chaos there. So yeah. self-assemble, Ikea. You had to yeah. do everything. Yeah. Oh, my yes. goodness. Yeah. <laughs> well, that I saves mean, you a lot of money, but it's also very lucky that you're quite handy. Yeah, yeah. But it was, uh, yeah, it's just a uh, difficult job. Yeah, I'm sure. Any missing bolts? <laughs> oh, there's lots. I, but it works. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There were quite a few. Uh, well, it looks yeah. like a beautiful kitchen, and I love the open plan. So you, oh, yeah. wherever you are in the kitchen, you can look straight out through the living room, straight out to Biwako. That's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Well, well that was the another principle of the design of the house. I wanted as much uh, open open plan planning as possible. Uh, the bedrooms upstairs, the children's bedroom don't have walls. They they have half walls, so again the air can flow through. I thought it was quite important actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about your toilet. Oh, yes. Is it a compost toilet? It's a compost toilet, yeah. Um, as a compromise, the upstairs toilet is a regular toilet, I have to, have to admit. But downstairs, the toilet is a compost. So it looks like a regular toilet, uh, but it has a kind of a, a pistol gun, just spray, high-velocity high water spray just for cleaning the bowl. Um, so it uses almost no water at all. So that drops down to a larger kind of container, which is basically a barrel, a drum, which you, you're you supposed to turn every day. Uh, in reality, it kind of gets turned about once a week. <laughs> but it's very, it's successful. It's been working since we started and it produces a lot of very high quality, you know, uh, compost. So yeah, it's working very well. Humanure, I think some people call it, right? Human manure, oh. humanure. That's yeah, it. that's I, what um, Kyle of the Permaculture Center calls it. So, is there certain areas that you can use humanure and kind of away from the regular garden, or what's what's the I, theory? Yeah, I read that you you're supposed to leave it a certain time to get rid of the pathogens. But I think uh, we just I just use it on fruit trees. I just use it on the trees and vines. So I wouldn't put it. I don't. I just just for other people's sake. I don't put it on vegetable garden. <laughs> so compare how effective it is, like compared to chicken manure or the other kinds. Do you notice a difference? I would say, well, they say it's it's particularly good because it has so many, so much variety of nutrients. You know, we humans have a huge, you know, we, we, we eat a lot and very high nutrient packed foods, which animals generally don't. Yeah. I mean, my goats are surviving on just grass and weeds. So I think in terms of that, it, it naturally would be very high and it's it's such a shame that you know cities aren't using it as they used to 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 fertilize farms around the cities. It's a it's a huge waste of resources, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. Going out into the sewer and the ocean. It goes, yeah, but it's I, I'm certain it's not used in most countries for farming. That's for sure. So, does it require water? Do you need water system going through? Does it require energy? No, no. no. There are there's um different. Systems with an electric fan to help ventilation. There's various 
models, but uh, I basically got the the one that had was all human power and no water. And you so, got yeah. that from in Japan, or did you have to import? Again, I imported uh, Sun. I think it's called Sunma. Is the com corp the company? I think it was Canadian, Sunma. So yeah. That was the first thing to arrive. So we had the toilet before the house. <laughs> <laughs> How much was it? Can I ask? It was about a uh, maybe two hundred thousand yen. Okay, including yeah. importing. Let's say two hundred and fifty. Yeah. Uh, but advice for any listeners: if you're going to import, do not order the hemp. Hemp. Um, uh, yeah, you know you have to add add stuff to it, sawdust or and uh, so I, I just purchased a whole load of hemp, you know, because I thought, oh great, hemp, industrial hemp, it's great, and it's it's a it's a quality product. But when we had to go to the port, we had to have it tested, which was very, of course, nerve wracking. Although you know it's industrial hemp, it's still a bit nerve wracking. So I wouldn't recommend ordering bags of hemp. A little, little bit stressful. Even though you see CBG oil, you see hemp products sometimes in Japan imported. Yeah, that's a that's an extra stress for sure. Absolutely, yeah. 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 Uh, let's let's talk about water. So we talked a little bit about water catchment systems. You've got a pond. You also have. It looks like a big tub of water. Do you have fish in there? We yeah we I think all. We have a lot of a lot of baths around the garden, which we collect. I think it's about over thousand five hundred liters we collect. But um, yeah, I I put fish in almost all of them because they they help get rid of the mosquitoes. And even if you you know you scoop out almost you know you're not there's still that much water left at the bottom, and then it's going to rain in a matter of days or weeks. So they they, they do okay. Yeah, great. So do you just use the water for the garden or do you use it for like the toilet or no, just the garden? My original plan was to have a rainwater catchment reservoir upstairs and to have a toilet, the, the upstairs toilet run off that, but that couldn't be fitted into the plans. Yeah. The, the, weight, the weight of the water and it has to be above the toilet and we don't have an attic. That was the main thing. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, that plan had to be uh, put onto the burner. Yeah, I asked about that as well when we did the remodel. Can I have rainwater going into the upstairs toilet or going into any of the toilets? But they said I would need like a chimney, a concrete chimney to support the rainwater tank because we have an old house. And they, oh. were, they were worried about the roof caving in, which is, you know, a decent concern. I appreciate yeah. that. Even, yeah, I mean, today, even you know, brand new buildings, they're still not putting in these systems, which there's no excuse. We're, we shouldn't be using drinking water for our toilets. It's just yeah. absurd, I yeah. think. So yeah. that's the whole idea of, of using gray water, right? Is yeah. catching, catching water or even using wastewater from your kitchen when you wash the dishes, reusing that in some way, maybe in the toilets, maybe yes. for washing the car. It's, yes. it's all a, a good idea. Water is not so expensive in Japan, but it's a great idea. Well, I, I always try to tell my students that well, I try to get them to discover the connection, but uh, basically I'm teaching them that, that you know, if you're, you're turning on water, you're, it's energy. That how did the water get to your yes. house? Where does it go? It represents energy in some form. So I think, you know, if you're wasting water, you're wasting energy. Yeah. So. They, they don't really make that connection. <laughs> so if you were cut off from the grid, you would be able to have some energy because you have solar. You would have some water because you have rain, rain catchment systems. And you have a working toilet. I mean, and you have your own food. So in terms of off-grid living, you're very close. Yeah, in an emergency, we could live off-grid. Um, my ideal would be to have the house off-grid, but it's it's... That's not a reality, to be honest. But uh, yeah, in any emergency, certainly we would, I think, survive a few days longer than a few people around us. <laughs> yeah. Do you do you know if that's allowed? Is off-grid living even allowed in Japan? Yeah, don't, don't yeah think. I don't know. 
it is or isn't. I think the, uh, again, purchasing the things you need to really make it work well, uh, they're just not available. They're, they're very difficult to source. Right. So that's one of the big problems. Uh, one, one thing I really want to do, and there's two summers now I've missed the chances to, 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 to sink a well. To yeah, but we've been told it needs to go down about twenty meters. So that's that's the next project. That's a, a big project. Get digging. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's, a long, that's well, a long way down. Yeah. 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 Let's let's talk about your car, biofuels. Very cool. Oh yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Thirteen years ago was kind of getting a family together. It's kind of the time to get a, a car. Is my first would, would be my first car, and uh, electric vehicles weren't really around. So this was the only alternative I could see, which would make me feel okay, was um, running it on waste oil, basically. It's actually not biodiesel. We biodiesel's chemically changed, and you need a lot of heat and equipment to produce it. So all we use is just waste. We collect waste oil and we filter it and it goes into the car and we've kind of modified the car it's it's called a two tank system so yeah for anyone who needs to know it's it's a WVO system a waste vegetable oil system and how do you collect it from like uh, Japanese restaurants because of tempura oil or right yeah there's a kind of a local farm uh, they call it uh, inaka kombini but it's it's basically uh, just selling tempura and local farm produce and so we get most of our oil from there and there's a another local restaurant just uh, by the station near us, and we get the second lot from there. That, that's it. That, that supplies everything we need. Yeah, it's great. Very good. What does it smell like? I've heard some people who use biofuel, they say it smells kind of like um, like a buttered potato or it smells like popcorn. What does your smell like? Yeah, most people say tempura. Uh-huh. Of course, in England, it would be fish and chips. <laughs> So I have an electric car now, so when I go up the hill, I don't have any guilt because I know there's no exhaust. So when you go up the hill, you must also have that guilt-free feeling a little bit. You're just spreading a nice smell of tempura. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> but it's still, ultimately, it's still a diesel car. It's kind right. of, yeah. So it's not a clean technology, but it's uh, it's carbon neutral, and uh, there, there are other, some pollutants it's actually reduced. Right. But, yeah. So it does have emissions because of... Oh yes. Is that, okay. Is it black? Like, is it as dirty as diesel? I think uh, from this is what I do. I research stuff and then I move on and I forget everything I research. But there's basically two main pollutants: so SOx, I think, and NOx. I think it's the NOx is about the same somehow as a diesel car, but the SOx is the the sulf, yeah the SOx is, is zero. So there's <clears throat> There's no losses, but there are quite a few gains. And of course, it's essentially it's carbon neutral. That's the main for me. That's the main one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Um, also, in the design, you have some sunroof design. I love the sunroof. Does it get really hot in summer, or it stays pretty cool? Uh, well, because of the insulation, it stays it stays cool. Yeah, yeah. Do you mean the sunroof in the? What do you mean for the house or? Yeah, the, in the house. Yeah. yeah. Oh, the, yes. The sky, skylights. Skylights. Yes. skylights yeah. Yes. Sorry. Yeah, they're triple. Again, they're triple glazed, so they keep out most of the most of the heat. Um, but they, I, again, that's something I would recommend anyone who's doing a self build would, if possible, include skylights because um, a vertical, you know, like a, a horizontal, well, a, a roof window. A, takes in about 40% extra light than a, a vertical window, a regular window. So they really do lighten up any area uh, significantly. So, yeah, yeah, it looks nice and bright, like in your living room. And that's, yes. you don't need to use lights then most of the time. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Um, and a few of our walls, when we designed the walls, we had windows in the interior walls, so that would let light into back rooms, so again, reducing the need for lighting, yeah, yeah. 
Wonderful. So I think we've talked about everything. We've got about five more minutes. Is there anything we haven't talked about that you'd like to touch on? Let's see. Um, main features. Well, not really. I mean, the, the main thing is we moved away from, of course, fossil fuels means going electric. But, uh, you know, it's important that you change your source of electricity as well, you know, your supplier. And that's, again, that's limited in Japan. The options for which electricity supplier, green suppliers of electricity are quite, still quite limited in Japan. I just did it. You can, you can do it. Uh, yeah, you, can do you, it but, you know, my Mizu. My Mizu, the yes. application to find your water. So they, yeah. they did a collaboration with Shizen Denka, Shizen okay. Denki, and yeah. you can go to the website and you can choose 100% renewable and then you pay your local, what, TEPCO or whatever your local electric company is, but they, they have to buy it from the renewable energy. So Good. you are supporting 100% renewable as well, it yeah. is possible. So I just wish more people would know, yeah, know about these schemes as well. Yeah, so. it wasn't super easy. I've heard some people say they did it in five minutes. Um, for my area, we do have solar, but of course it doesn't cover all of our electrical needs. So when I changed over, I had to call the electric company. I had to get certain numbers. So it was a little bit fiddly, but it, you yeah. know, it took me maybe half a day at most. Oh, it's it's okay, not yeah. not impossible. Yeah. Yes. You yeah. you need to have Japanese though, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. which is always tricky. Um, nope. We have a, a question from Chilin Kansai. He's a, another Tesla driver like me. Uh, oh. What is the size of the solar system, and is there a battery system? If not, is there a plan to add one? Yeah, when we bought the system, battery technology, the options weren't there. Like Tesla has now a home battery kit stuff you know it's wonderful options in in the states but um so we got a very small battery system for emergencies but the main system no we don't have a battery system and that would be nice because that gets you off grid if you need you know um the system is 4.9 kilowatts oh nice yeah. nice size one and, uh, like i like i mentioned it produces about on average throughout the year twice as much as we use so yeah yeah I, I have only a three kilowatt system, and then yeah. if I charge my Tesla from home during the day, I, I, I feel good because it's coming from my solar. Um, but it's, of course, not at night, and we don't have a battery yet. People always ask me, can you reverse engineer so the Tesla charges the house at night? Because <laughs> Tesla is basically a big battery car, right? Um, but you can't do that, apparently. Oh. There are some electric cars you can do that, but... Oh. Not the Tesla, not yet. Okay. Maybe yeah, someday. An emergency, that would be useful, of course. Uh, yeah. Uh, one just yeah. echo living point that I, I like, I got from your Facebook, is you're growing the plant that you can make a loofah from? Oh, yes. Yeah. That's, that's great. Right. What is the plant called? I don't know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, so, how do you do it? So you grow the plant and then you just dry it? Yeah, I just found them. They were amongst the pumpkins and something cucumber area, which is was overgrown at the time. And they just dried out. They were, obviously couldn't be eaten, but they, I, I liked the look of them. And then I realized inside was the sponge. And wow, yeah. So we're growing them again this year. Fantastic. So I, I, I want to do, yeah, more. <laughs> and then you're you're using it to wash plates or to in the shower. Yeah, you can use them. Any, you know, any sponge. You know, the, those plastic sponges. They will completely replace. They can replace them. They're they're perfect. They don't break up. They last quite a long time. Amazing, really. That's yeah. great. Any other echo tips that you and the family are doing? Ooh, no. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, difficult to. No, no, that's you. fine. Uh, Molly says, I think it's called a luffa gourd. She says. That's it. That's it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, when I was, um, I know I, there was an article on the the, uh, the National Trust in England were promoting this as a an idea. It was on a, a news program. Yeah. But yeah, I'd and anyone in the city can do it because it's a vine. So yeah, 
it looks like um, yeah, like a cucumber, but it, it, it the season is much longer. It takes longer to grow. So. And uh, you also have some activists in the house. Your daughter did a change or campaign. Is that right? How did that uh, go? Yeah, well, they they I try and get them involved as much as possible. They're, uh, they there was a tree, a local tree, got cut down, and my my daughters made a sign, a kind of rest in peace sign about all the shade that's been. Thank you for all the shade and everything they gave us, just to make the locals feel a bit guilty. <laughs> Oh, that's they, nice. They, of course, they, they clean the beach quite often. So, yeah, yeah small things. That's great. Yeah. And then this this was about reducing plastic uh, packaging. So change, change.org that you shared, was that one of your daughters or one of your students was doing that campaign? Uh, 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 that was my both my daughter and I think the student, that was the students, I think, did that mostly. Yeah. So communicating back to the companies about... Um, what you want to see as consumers and less packaging is, of course, a great part of the process. Yes, it's really yeah. nice to see that. Yeah, yeah. I love the campaigns in, in other countries where you take back your plastic to yeah to the supermarket and say, okay, thank you, here it is. Yeah, I know that TerraCycle is active in Japan and they do take back some of the plastic that is hard to recycle, and then they work with the companies and they also have a, a loop system where they're trying to get started for the home delivery for shopping and then okay. reuse all the containers. So oh. hopefully that'll come more around Japan. I think they're just piloting it now, maybe. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, I haven't seen any products with that yet, but uh, in England I've seen TerraCycle, but yeah, not, not yet here. But yeah. yeah, it's good. Things will come slowly. I hope so. The more uh, we have examples like yours, and the more we have activism by students and your children, that yeah. that really helps a lot. So thank you so much for all you're doing and uh, well, you. sharing your story with us. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. If um, people want to learn more, let's give your website, your blog about the house. Are you Please, keeping yeah. that up? I, I try to. <laughs> <laughs> please do share yeah and that would be my tip actually is just do do the things you think you want to do like you know taking your chopsticks to restaurant your own chopsticks people notice and yeah that's that's an education educate others maybe passively is, is would be my tip yeah and always asking asking politely if things are possible right oh, yeah. oh like oh, is yeah. it okay to get that without a straw please like do it really nicely or yeah. can i use my own bag or can i use my own container you know just keep asking and if no no okay no problem right <laughs> absolutely <laughs> well thank you so much and if you're interested um i will put the link below for the shiga echo house project and you have lots of great photos there lots of good explanation um, I think people will be able to find links to how to do it themselves. So thank yes. you so much for doing that. That's a great resource. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me today. It's been yeah. Yeah, fun. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for your comments. And uh, join us again tomorrow, 9.30. We're talking to John Walsh. He is an urban gardening coach in Tokyo, helping people make food, on their balconies and gardens. So please join us again tomorrow. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a good day. Take care. Bye.